this book is at the most basic level about one of the most fundamental aspects of Atlantic slavery, the unrelenting struggle of enslaved people in the British Caribbean here for peace to survive. Truth be told, when I started this project 12, 13 years ago, I didn't know that I was going to focus on Burbese. I'm not Guyanese, as many of you can probably guess from my American accent. Um, and so, and I didn't know much about Guyana, frankly, when I started this project. What I did know was that I wanted to understand how enslaved people in the Caribbean fought to survive in spite of the brutal conditions they faced, hostile conditions, as Juliet was just mentioning. Historians had known for a long time that Atlantic slave societies were death traps, to put it bluntly. In Berbice and most other Atlantic slave societies, especially those that produced sugar, death rates exceeded birth rates, enslaved populations did not reproduce themselves, and planters relied on the transatlantic slave trade to replace people that they worked to death. These were all well known, but rather than simply acknowledging those as demographic facts, I wanted to know what the unrelenting struggle to try to live, try to make a life in a world of death meant for enslaved people on a day-to-day -day level. Or put differently, what would happen if we took the problem of survival seriously? And it turned out that Guyana, and especially Berbice, was an ideal place to consider this problem of survival. And that's thanks to an extraordinary set of records that separates Guyana really from anywhere else in the Americas. Um, I can't overstate just how rich the archival records for the history of slavery in Guyana are. Um, when you compare them to the Caribbean, the United States, even Brazil and other Latin American slave societies. And so I'd like to say a little bit about these records and um, how Guyana came to have them, how we have access to them. They are a product of the colony's unique historical development. And this is true to a lesser extent for Demerara and Essequibo as well. As many of you probably know, in the 17th century, so we're going very far back now, Berbice was first colonized by the Dutch, who established plantations really far up on the Berbice River. If you look on this map here, those are probably um, up, up river of where you see Fort Nassau and Paraboom labeled abandoned plantations really on this map, which is the, the British period I focus on. Um, of course, the Dutch developed slavery uh, well before the British conquered the colony at the end of the 18th century. The result, or one result of this Dutch heritage is that Berbice harbors a rare set of records produced by a legal official known as the Fiscal. Under Dutch rule, enslaved people in Berbice had limited legal rights and could, at least in theory, air their grievances before the Fiscal, who could then prosecute plantation overseers, managers, slave owners, for crimes or offenses against enslaved people certain types of abuses that were considered beyond uh, what was legally accepted. The fiscal also responded to complaints from free people against enslaved people for a variety of crimes, everything from theft to running away, assault, murder, or the practice of the Afro-Caribbean spiritual healing complex known as obia. Sometimes enslaved people also complain against one another. The British over maintained this institution of the fiscal, and that separates Berbice in a really important way for historians of slavery from other British colonies like Jamaica or Barbados, where enslaved people limited, legal rights are limited and more difficult to enforce, and importantly for me, where their voices are so much harder to find in the archive. The other reason Berbice is so well documented um, has to do with the slide you now see on your screen. And it has to do with when and how Berbice was incorporated into the British Empire. This was an era when the crown or the metropolitan government was wary about giving its colonies too much legislative autonomy, right? The American Revolution was fresh in lawmakers' minds. And so what the crown did with these newly governed uh, or newly conquered colonies, as they described them, like Berbice, Demerara, Trinidad, was really govern them with a heavy hand. 
the implications of this for slavery was that Berbice became an ideal location for the British government's experiment in what it called amelioration, which was a process of trying to gradually reform slavery through new laws and new mechanisms of surveillance to better regulate the treatment of enslaved people. One important part of the imperial intervention was the creation of a whole new set of records and a new crown official who took over and expanded the fiscal's role known as the protector of slaves. Um, actually, if we can stay on that previous slide for just a minute, Samuel, we'll get to this, thank you. Um, I wanted to just give you a very brief sense of what these records look like in a tangible way. Uh, they are archived at the British National Archives, um, inconveniently for a uh, vast majority of Guyanese citizens, right? One would have to travel to London to see most of these. Um, there are several large volumes, a few dozen if you combine Berbice and Demerara and Essequibo, and they're full of individual complaints, like the one you see here, um, from enslaved people about the things that mattered to them. Uh, they also have other types of evidence, records, letters, correspondence, tables, statistics. Taken together, the records of the fiscals and the protectors of slaves are the single largest archive of first person testimony from and about enslaved people anywhere in the Americas. And they're, to my mind, kind of um, ridiculously unknown, especially outside of Guyana as part of a kind of more general uh, process of ignoring Guyana even in the, the um, scholarly community, right? We're so focused even in the West Indies on Jamaica, on Barbados, um, and that's fine. But, but what that's meant is we've in some ways ignored these records which span some 10,000 pages or more. These records reveal in astonishing and often painful detail the world that South Africans and their descendants created. They allow for an unusually intimate study of life and death under slavery. These records uh, include testimony from literally thousands of enslaved people who we can identify by name, as well as free people of color and white enslavers, managers, overseers, owners. They shed light on almost everything we might wanna know about enslaved people's lives. Although of course, in, in limited ways, labor, punishment, family life, spiritual practice. Um, most complaints, I should say, from enslaved people failed. That is, they were dismissed or overruled, about two thirds. But even then, I would argue these records are a remarkable window into one of the most brutal slave societies in the Americas. They're a powerful record of enslaved people's determination, as one woman from Berbice put it, to get my right. And so with the time I have left, I'd like to share just one of the many stories preserved in these records. Um, and we can go to the next slide now, please, Samuel. This is the story of an enslaved man named Harry. And this is the story that I opened my book with. What you see here is just one, one page, one brief excerpt from this larger case. Harry was an enslaved African man oh. on a coffee estate. I'm, I'm, I'm on Zoom. I'm on Zoom, I call you. Uh -huh. By 1825, <laughs> okay. when Harry was in his mid thirties, he became very sick. This was of course a predictable consequence after decades of brutal work in one of the most hostile disease environments in the Caribbean. By June of that year, Harry was so ill that his whole body swelled and he barely moved. This was according to his friend, Billy, who was another enslaved African on the same plantation. Harry's own so angry that Harry was not working that he flogged Harry in an effort to try to force him back to the field, back to work. But of course that didn't work. A few days later, Harry was barely breathing by the time his owner sent him to the plantation's sick house or hospital. The owner apparently expected Harry to die soon. And so he had an enslaved carpenter make a coffin. Harry's friend, Billy described the horrifying scene that unfolded when the carpenter went to where Harry was lying. Harry opened his eyes and saw the carpenter holding a measuring stick above him. Harry realized immediately what was happening. He struggled briefly to sit up and then gave up and hung his head down. His friend Billy was horrified by this and protested to the owner that it was, in his words, not good nor right fashion to make a coffin for a living man. His owner ignored him 
and then ordered Billy and two other men to dig a grave. A few hours later, Harry was still alive, barely, and frothing at the mouth when he was put into the coffin and sealed up before being buried alive. One of the most remarkable things about this case, I think, is not so much its horror. Berbice and the Caribbean were full of similar atrocities during the era of slavery, but rather that we know about it at all, that we're even able to understand what happened and tell the story. And we only know about it, right, about the final hours of Billy's life, because his friend Billy was angry and brave enough to complain about it, about what had happened first to a militia officer and then to the fiscal. The fiscal interrogated Billy and then summoned Billy's owner and other witnesses to his New Amsterdam office to testify. Billy told the fiscal just how callous and cruel their owner was, even as Harry lay dying. Indeed, according to Billy, the owner was mad at Harry for dying on him. In front of everybody else who had gathered, he called Harry a bad Negro and said that laziness had killed him. The owner, meanwhile, um, when interrogated by the fiscal, denied Billy's story and said that Billy, too, was, in his words, a lazy and idle Negro. Ultimately, the fiscal believed Billy's testimony, but found out that, or, or rather found that the owner had committed no criminal act. He lightly scolded the owner before handing Billy back over to him to be punished at his discretion. Billy had previously experienced flogging so severe that he vomited and then fainted and had once seen his owner force another man to drink cow's urine. And so he must have known all too well what kind of sadistic tortures he would face for having made a formal and public complaint against his owner. This story is just one of several hundred cases preserved in this shockingly underutilized archive that separates Burbese and its neighboring colonies from other slave societies in the Americas. The stories there in this archive reveal human nature at its worst and best. They are, for me, frankly, painful to read, to write about, and to tell. But I think if we want to better understand enslaved people's ordeal, then we need to listen to them carefully. They're worth sitting with. And so if we zoom out, what can these documents, read through the lens of survival, tell us about enslaved people's world? For me, they fundamentally changed the way I thought about slavery, power, and enslaved people's agency. And they led me to question some of the most important assumptions or tropes that have shaped the study of slavery for the past several decades. In general, the domination and resistance framework that continues to inspire so much of the scholarship on slavery, I think makes two problematic assumptions. First, that the organizing principle for enslaved people's politics was the struggle for freedom, or the effort to escape slavery. And second, that enslaved people's lives are best understood by focusing exclusively on their efforts to resist their enslavers. As I see it, and this is based on my, my reading of these um, records over several years, this approach doesn't really allow us to really appreciate the life and death struggles of enslaved people or the complex social relationships they had to navigate. And so I was trying as hard as possible with this project to see enslaved, uh, enslaved people's world as much as I could through their eyes or at least over their shoulders. And what I found was that in Berbice, and I suspect this is true for other slave societies as well, enslaved people themselves experienced slavery as first and foremost a fight to stay alive. The more I read, the more clearly I came to see that the story um, that is often told of enslaved people's uh, resistance to slavery and the story of their struggle to survive, which is what I was primarily interested in, those stories intersected but were not the same story. And so what I've tried to show in this book is that the struggle to survive was at the center of enslaved people's experience. And that foregrounding that problem of survival can help us better understand some of the most important issues and themes in the historiography of slavery, from violence and punishment to labor, cultural and spiritual practices, family life, 
and what historians have called the slave's economy. When enslaved people went to colonial officials to protest the legitimacy of the flogging they endured, when they negotiated daily workloads with their drivers, managers, and overseers, when they used obia and other spiritual techniques to treat epidemic disease or solve other problems, when they sought protection from abusive partners, and when they asserted hard fought customary rights to cultivate their own provision grounds or gardens and to accumulate and sell property, their most urgent goal was to stay alive. In Burpees and in other Caribbean slave societies, plantations consumed black lives at an unimaginable rate and enslavers had little regard for slave people's suffering. And yet, Enslaved people in Burbese displayed a tenacious will to survive. In order to do so, they battled their enslavers, their environment, and sometimes one another. It's that story of those struggles that I've tried to capture with this book. Um, I'll end here, we can go to the very last slide. Uh, Samuel, let me thank you in advance for your questions, your comments. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us and especially those of you who um, read and shared this book. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Randy Brown, Xavier University, for presenting us with a synopsis of your very important text, Surviving Slavery in the British Caribbean. What you have said gives us much um, food for thought and perhaps encourages us to move in another direction much more forcibly. Thank you. For those of you who just joined us, please remember to mute your mics, please, or your voices, which might be soft to you, would interrupt the speakers and be more audible than you would imagine. Our second speaker, and right on time we are, is Rod Westmus. And Rod is one of several essays in a text published by London University. And he will be speaking particularly on maybe one day I will go home. So let's listen to what Rod Westmus has to tell us about the question of home and the question of the current diaspora and how we are beginning to meld the two and also re-examine with a less jaundiced eye, I like that word, the question of home. Ladies and gentlemen, Rod Westmus. Thank you, Juliet. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Gr greetings from London. Uh, could you put uh, slide one on for me? Please, Samuel. Okay. There we go. Um, it is indeed an honor to be asked to participate in the 2020 Lit Symposium and Literary Hang to discuss memory, migration, and decolonization in the Caribbean and beyond, of which I edited al along with three others, Dr. Jack Webb, Maria del Pilar Caladine, and William Tantum. In February of this year, the book was published by the University of London Press, but due to COVID-19, our official launch has been put on hold until later in the year. Uh, slide two, if you would, please. So the evolution of the project and my involvement began in the autumn of 2016. My wife, Dr. Juanita Cox, answered an online appeal within her academic circles from Dr. Jack Webb, of the University of London Senate House, requesting assistance from someone within the Windrush diaspora to seek out and assist in interviewing members of the community. His goal was to better understand the lives of the many Caribbean migrants and processes of decolonization. He further explained that the primary objective was to place academic knowledges of decolonization with those of the Caribbean community, and in particular, those of the Windrush generation. 
Through placing academia in conversation with individual self-reflections of, de of decolonization, we were able to consider in new ways how academics have traditionally accepted and enforced colonial structures rather than critiqued and confronted them. So aside from myself, we have contributions from three other London-based Guyanese, and I'd like to mention them, Bruce Nobrega, Anne Braithwaite, and Peter Ramraker. Slide three, please. Before I go any further, just let me define to you what is meant by the Windrush generation. The Windrush generation refers to the immigrants who were invited to the UK between 1948 and 1971 from the Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, British Guyana, and Barbados. The name derives from the ship MV Empire Windrush, which on the 22nd of June, 1948, docked in Tilbury, Essex, England, bringing 1,027 passengers. Although Jamaicans were a little over 50% of the total, there were 44 Guyanese who came via Trinidad. Slide four, please. Each passenger was processed at the passport section of the dock and a sea arrival landing card was filled out in their name. I managed to locate the form for my uncle Joshua who left British Guyana in 1948 as a 30 year old mechanic. I dare say he may have been one of the many smiling faces looking over the railing of MB Windrush as you see in the photograph there. By most accounts, most of the uh, folks on board the ship were, were very upbeat and happy for their arrival in London. Here is a brief video accompanied by the Trinidadian Calyps Calypsonian Lord Kitchener singing London is the place for me, which has become somewhat of an anthem for the Windrush generation. So if you could play that video. No, that's not the video. That... that that uh, is the second video. Video one, please. It should be. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America. India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Well, believe me, I am speaking broad-mindedly. I am glad to know my mother country. I've been traveling to countries years ago, but this is the place I wanted to know. To live in London, you are rarely come back there. Because the English people are very much sociable. They take you here and they take you there, and they make you feel like a millionaire. So London, that's the place for me. Down Shaffrey Avenue. There you would laugh and talk and enjoy the bridge and admire the beautiful scenery of London. That's the best one. Yes, I cannot complain of the time I have spent. I mean, my life in London is really magnificent. I have every comfort and every sport, and my resident is at Hampton Court. So London, that's the way for me.
Thank you. Um, slide number five, please. Slide number five. London, in 1948, um, Britain was just beginning to recover from the ruins of the war. Housing was a huge problem and stayed that way in, for about two decades. There was plenty of work, but those from the Caribbean were not very well received. Conflicts arose around issues of accommodation. Slide number six, please. Excluded from much of the social and economic life around them, they began to create a new world, one consisting of the institutions that they brought with them, such as churches, foods, entertainment, along with the cooperative method of savings called the partner system. The partner system would eventually assist many to purchase their own homes. And at the same time, many began to participate in institutions to which they have uh, had access to, such as trade unions, local councils, political parties, and professional organizations. But just uh, look at those signs there, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Uh, slide number seven, please. Juanita and I, my wife Juanita and I felt that as a result of our recently established initiative, Guyana Speaks, we had gathered enough friends within the community to give substance to this proposed project. Guyana Speaks was an idea conceived while we were both living in Guyana from 2013 to 2015, reflecting upon its talented people in Guyana and abroad, the beauty of the country, its rich and varied history and potential greatness. We realized that there were many stories that had to be told. The large Guyanese diaspora in the UK we felt would support a monthly gathering at a convenient and easily accessible London location. So now in its fourth year, Guyana Speaks has established itself as a regular fixture within the diaspora. Each program presents three knowledgeable speakers. Um, I should just segue and say Randy has been a speaker for us. And they appeared in person or either via Skype. We've had subjects such as the Indian arrival, Guyana's architectural history, um, phenomenal Guyanese women, the Jonestown tragedy, the um, indigenous Guyanese, just to name a few. But confident that we were in a unique position to partner with Dr. Webb, I, co I contacted him and spoke about the Guyanese perspective. A list of potential interviewees was drawn up and the project commenced. Slide number eight, please. It was highly unusual to undertake such a venture whereby Guyanese were the prime targets as opposed to Jamaicans, which is the largest of the Windrush era. But undoubted, undaunted, excuse me, we proceeded to schedule our weekly interviews. 93-year-old Joyce Trotman and 91-year-old Eric Huntley became the two interviewees that I would select for inclusion in the book. In the course of a year, we interviewed 26 individuals, most of whom I, I hope to make available shortly via podcasts. But questions gravitated not only around migration, but that of life in general. So just here are a few of the questions that uh, I asked and the top answers. What year did you leave BG? Well, the average year was 1962. What were your first impressions of England? The most common answer was it was dark, cold, and dreary. When growing up in BG, what was your favorite sweetie? And the answer was not in. Parker never done sweetie. And another one was charms assorted sour balls. I, I so wish I had them to, to give these individuals. What sounds did you miss most? The rain falling on the zinc roof. Kiskadi singing. The rain, man, the rain. And then what was a typical Sunday meal? Soup with lots of provision and fufu. Kalaloo soup with cutty cutty shin bone and cow heel. Or beef soup with plenty of plantain, cassava, and pigeon peas. And so we tried to get a little bit personal in the questions, and it, it provided for some great writing. Uh, 
So incorporating some of the responses, I wrote the prologue to the book, which I'd just like to read to you now. To say goodbye to home was an extremely perplexing request made by the motherland to its colonial citizens. That is exactly what was confronting tens of thousands of men, women, and children who were contemplating the journey to their England. With grip, that suitcase to, to those that don't know, with grip in hand, wearing their Sunday best, fedora donned at a slight angle, a gleaming smile with ample supply of smokes for the long voyage, kisses were blown, hankies were waved. It was goodbye, <laughs> land, of, land of my birth, and hello to England. We asked, what, sorry, when asked, what were they going to miss most when they left home? The responses were varied, such as the sound of rain beating hard on the zinc roof, the smell of cow dung early in the morning, the weekend spent at the Sweetwater Creeks, shouts of Argosy Chronicle and Graphic from the newspaper vendors, a juicy mango or a fleshy and a fleshy guinip, which is also called Spanish lime. But most of all, it was the people left behind, uncles, aunts, mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. The distance would be hard to bridge, yet each knew this fresh op there was a fresh opportunity to carve out a new future, which was theirs for the taking. Getting a job was not a problem. The employment ex exchanges were advertising for factory workers, dishwashers, welders, stockroom attendants, street sweepers, and nurses. There were just a few of the positions being advertised. But my father, Patrick, who was a manager at one of the many sawmills in Guyana's interior, was one of those newly arrived citizens thumbing through those job cards. And at 36, Patrick's managerial options were very few to non-existent. No sawmills were in London. His reflection to me many years later on his decision to apply for a job as a stockroom attendant at the John Lewis department store on London's Oxford Street was that it had not been an easy one. What would my father think? He was a prominent civil servant all of his life in Georgetown. He was even awarded the ISO, which is the Imperial Service Order. But status back home was no longer a consideration. Making a living, finding a home, sending money back to the family to join him were his priority. John Lewis gave him a, the start that he needed. His job description was simple. Sweep the floors, take out the rubbish, and pack the shelves. And after a year of loyal service, the manage management recognized his dedication and hard work by awarding him what was then known as a guinea, and in today's money, it's $47. They awarded him that in his pay, pay packet, his wage packet. But like many of his Windrush generation, Patrick was willing to accept whatever viable offer came his way. Black and brown faces were rapidly becoming commonplace on the streets of London. The bus drivers and conductors, the train ticket collectors and porters, nurses and orderlies, they were all positions proudly filled by the newly arrived citizens of the empire. And as a young family from British Guyana, each day something new was being discovered. The ugly side of the British, the English, were gradually, was gradually emerging. The next door neighbors were not for mixing, often describing us as the coloreds upstairs cooking all that smelly food. The odd names we were given, Wog, Chalky, Nignog, or simply the Black Bastards became commonplace. The voices from back home had become a faded memory for many. Phone calls were expensive and a rarity, mainly Christmas or the occasional family announcements. When they did actually happen, it was a major production. A phone call to the overseas operator to book the call home was the necessary first step. The crackly reception a couple of hours later would often consist of small talk. How's granny? The government did what? We miss the weary pepper and some kiasreep. She married who? No, I haven't seen the Queen yet. The English lifestyle was gradually blending into our unique British Guyana memories. In fact, the new life, in spite of the many challenges, has its positive side. Television, seaside trips, grapes and apples, double-decker buses, ice cream setting on a cold winter sill at wi winter's windowsill, and the friendships of Guyanese and other West Indians that 
for better or worse, made, mother, made the motherland more tolerable. So maybe one day I will go home, or maybe not. But with the past couple, within the past couple of years, many from the Windrush generation and era have been falsely accused of being illegal immigrants. Most have come to this country, had come to this country as young children. And here's a brief video of a member of parliament, David Lammy, himself a Harvard educated lawyer of Guyanese descent, expressing his anger at the ruling British government for their apparent racist actions with regard to the Windrush generation. Well, can I say to the Home Secretary that the relationship between this country and the West Indies and Caribbean is inextricable. The first British ships arrived in the Caribbean in 1623, and despite slavery, despite colonization, 25,000 Caribbeans served in the First World War and Second World War alongside British troops. When my parents and their generation arrived in this country under the Nationality Act of 1948, they arrived here as British citizens. It is inhumane and cruel for so many of that Windrush generation to have suffered so long in this condition and for the Secretary of State only to have made a statement today on this issue. Can she explain how many have been deported? She suggested earlier that she would ask the High Commissioners. It is her department that has deported them. She should know the number. Can she tell the House how many have been detained as prisoners in their own country? Can she tell the House how many have been denied health under the National Health Service? How many have denied pensions? How many have lost their job? This is a day of national shame, and it has come about because of a hostile environment policy that was begun under her Prime Minister. Let us call it as it is. If you lay down with dogs, you get fleas. And that is what has happened with this far-right rhetoric in this country. Can she apologise properly? Can she explain how quickly this team will act to ensure that the thousands of British men and women denied their rights in this country under her watch in the Home Office are satisfied? Bruce Nobreger in his chapter entitled, Why Did We Come? He wrote, for many in Britain, the new arrivals were economic migrants, but for some Caribbean people, this was a homecoming of an overseas, overseas citizenry. So why did we stay? This is an indomitable question which perpetually enters our thoughts. Was it just the audacity of hope? There was always the initial hope dreams of upliftment and a better life. But in conclusion, we still have a long way to go here in the UK with regard to race relations. Yet, I do believe that our approach to examine and understand the phenomena and the circumstances that embody the pioneering work that we have done will serve a useful purpose for generations to come. Thank you very much. Back to you, Juliet. Thank you, Rod. Early in your presentation, we received a chat from someone who said that the calypso that you played about London yes. made her cry. Oh. <laughs> made her cry. And yeah. I, I, us viewing it all these years, like we are the children of that Windrush generation. Yes. It's an expectation. When you look at the young men in their suits, and those suits, those were expensive suits in those days. They made and them themselves. A lot of them made them themselves. They were going home. You know, they were going to wear, they expected to be welcomed. And they arrived a bombed out shelter of a country. Yeah. It was a bombed out shell. And there's a dichotomy between this pristine land, for, and I'm talking about Guyana now, that they left and this horrible, cold place. One of our writers um, commented on that, the coldness, the brainness, 
of London and of England in general. It was. It Thank was. you. Thank You're you. welcome. You're Thank welcome. you. And now, um, for those of us who have just joined the group, you can see the connection between what we said earlier about Randy's surviving slavery and Rod's talking about seeing a new slavery in a new land, in a place that was supposed to be the mother, the comfort, and so on. We are linking these tropes throughout our discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next speaker is Jillian Richards Graves. Jillian is going to do something a little different. <laughs> and she will tell you all about it in a few seconds. This is her forthcoming publication, re and we learn how to say that word quickly in the months ahead. And she will be discussing African Chinese kwekwe. Pay attention to what she's saying, very important, based on what Randy has just said and what Rod has just said. Ladies and gentlemen, Jillian, Richards. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for having me. The title of my upcoming book is Rediasporization, African Guyanese Kwekwe. This book is informed by more than a decade of ethnographic research I conducted in New York City and Guyana on the Kwekwe ritual. It examines the process by which an existing diaspora becomes a new one or the process by which newer diasporas are created out of existing ones. I started this research in 2005 at the first Kwekwe night and attended, and attended many more after that. Um, kindly show figure 1.2, the Guyana Folk Festival flyer from 2015. I'm not going in order, sorry. <laughs> the Ghana Folk Festival flyer from 2015, figure 1.2. I only have 1.3, just this one, the, the book. I don't, I don't think I have a 1.2. You keep scrolling down. Okay. This uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, that's an older, is, is that the bottom? Okay, that's all yeah. right. Okay. That's quite fine. Um, so, Come to my Kwekwe or Kwekwe Night in New York City features a reenactment of the traditional Kwekwe that draws individuals from all over the world for a time of jollification, education, and just, um, you know, Guyanese, Guyanese and the gathering of Guyanese and their friends. But it is not associated with an actual wedding. Nobody is really getting married, even though they often choose, the officials often choose a couple that might be engaged or something like that. So in order to do a comparative analysis of what was happening in Guyana and the United States with this Kwekwe ritual, I traveled to Guyana in 2008, where I spent 16 months traveling around the country and attending people's Kwekwe, or as we would say, pulping people's Kwekwe. As an anthropologist, we gather information by conducting ethnographic research. This includes interviews, participant observation, archival research, and in many instances, just observing people's interactions in their daily lives. It, is, it was quite interesting to see over the course of, of about 15 years, how the traditional or the wedding-based Kwekwe has changed and how Come to My Kwekwe, this reenactment in New York City has become a prominent fixture in the African Guyanese community. Before moving forward, I'd like to give you a background on the Kwekwe ritual for those who might not be familiar with it. So if you can show figure 1.1, deconstructing the traditional Kwekwe, I'd like to um, talk about, uh, show that as I talk. So Kwekwe, also known as Karkele and Mayan. Karkele, Mayan, Kwekwe, you'll hear different pronunciations of it, is an African Guyanese pre-wedding ritual. <laughs> um, the, could you kindly show the overarching ritual segments 
and the wedding base quackware, -quack, the table. Okay, you can leave that, that'll work. Okay, so quackware has about six distinct um, sections or segments and each segment is executed with song and dance. Some of the segments include a procession from the groom's residence the, to the bride's residence. So the groom and his nation or his, <clears throat> his relatives, his supporters, his family, they would all go down the street, come down the street walking towards the bride's residence as they sing songs like coming down with a bunch of roses. When they get to the, <clears throat> to the bride's residence, there's a meeting at the gate. And the table that you see here shows that at every, like every segment or the beginning of every segment presents a sort of an obstacle to the groom and his family. So when they meet at the gate, they don't just get to come in freely. The bride and her family would pre, um, close the gate. So the groom and his nation would push against the gate and sing songs like, open the door, let the man come in. Allah, we are one family, open the door, let the man come in. And so eventually um, the groom and his nation would be let in. But when they, when they enter the compound, of the yard of the bride, there will be another obstacle. That is that the, the bride would be hidden and the groom and his nation would be required to find this bride. So as they search for the bride, um, they would sing songs, songs um, like, um, I wonder where my love are gone, search them, go find them. And um, eventually they find the bride. And then there's what the bride is placed on a chair and she's covered with a white sheet. And in that covering, um, when she's covered during that time, there's what is the, what we call the buying of the bride or the negotiation of bride price, right? And so, as I said before, songs are sung at every, at every stage, at every, um, at, at, during every segment. So you have an idea of what segment in the Quaker ritual you're, you're currently in based on some of the songs that are being sung. So after the negotiation of bride price, the group comes together and they usually do, um, they usually do uh, a dance in a counterclockwise, a, a circle that moves counterclockwise. And so if you can show, um, I think, I don't know if you have this one, figure 3.3, where the older women are showing the, um, the groom how to. I, I don't think so. I don't know what's happening because all of those, I, anyway. Okay, <laughs> we will work with what we have. So in any case, um, so, what, what happens in this circle is that there's the singing and the dancing that takes place often provides, often provides commentary on gendered expectations in the Guyanese society, right? So um, it's not just singing for fun. In times past, this singing was meant to chide. It was meant to poke fun at the groom's family. It was meant to instruct, to provide instruction to the bride and groom on how they should behave in marriage. So this singing was functional. The dancing was functional. And one of the things I discovered in, um, in my research is that this traditional or wedding-based kwekwe um, has a lot of elements of puberty rites of passage in African tradition, in which young women and men are separated from the larger community and they are secluded. They are secluded where they are taught, where the young women are taught by older women and the young men are taught by older men on how to be properly, um, properly socialized men and women in the society. So I also, as I, as I continued doing my research, I realized that the Kwekwe ritual, while the word Kwekwe is only found in the Guyanese community. Um, the elements of the Kwekwe ritual we see are also prevalent or um, in indi indigenous African marriages or what they were called traditional African marriages. So um, in, in um, many traditional African indigenous African marriages, 
you don't, as a man, go to ask for a girl's hand um, in marriage. You go with your people, you go with your nation, you, you go with, generally the, the boy would show up with the men, his, the men folk, his uncles, his father to ask. So we see that also, this sort of procession from the grooms to the brides. We see the negotiation of bride price. And if we look at, for example, among the Igbos of Nigeria, they have the wine carrying ceremony, which they call Ibankwo. And that is that, that is very, it has a lot of similar elements of the Kwekwe ritual. What we also see um, happening is that today in indigenous African marriages, you have um, the traditional marriage or the indigenous marriage will take place before what they call the white wedding. And this is something that was also similar among um, enslaved African Guyanese where the enslaved, enslaved Africans were not allowed to marry or marriage was not regarded, their marriages were not regarded as legal. So what ended up happening is that the Kwekwe, which would have been that indigenous African marriage, ended up um, becoming that pre-wedding ritual because it now has to be done before they do what, um, what the enslavers would have regarded as, as legal or right or just, right? And so because Kwekwe is linked, I, I, I argue that because Kwekwe is linked to such a crucial life cycle ritual like marriage, and because it encompasses so many of um, so many African and Guyanese traditions, such as food and music and dance and gender and religion, it remains one of the only uniquely African Guyanese ritual rituals. It is also why Kwekwe is featured prominently in this process of rediasporization. So as I move on to talk about rediasporization, the process of re-becoming, it's important for me to discuss the process of diasporization. That is the, the process by which a group becomes a diaspora. The word diaspora simply means dispersal, right? Where a group moves from its homeland and takes up homage um, in another place. We call that a diaspora, it means dispersal. I discuss in my book, the process of diasporization as a three phase process whereby each phase results in fractures or disruptions that require the community to take action to rectify them. There's first a physical separation. Um, can, do you have the, the, the triangle that shows? Yeah, that, thank you very much. So there's first um, a physical separation in the first stage of diasporization, this physical separation causes a physical fracture of the group from a geographic space or residence, particularly one in which they have resided for several generations and have come to regard as home. There are many reasons, um, Rod mentioned some of them, but there are many reasons that groups um, leave or must are, are forced to leave their homelands. There are push factors and pull factors. Push factors are often the negative factors that causes um, factors that cause a group to, to leave. So, so war, slavery, negative things that are happening where they are. And then there are pull factors. Think of it as the bright lights that are drawing them, often economic, um, economic opportunities that cause them to leave. Um, anthropologist Robin Cohen has argued that the diverse reasons for separation from home, from your, from, from the homeland also create different types of diasporas. Robin Cohen mentions victim diasporas, labor diasporas, trade diasporas, imperial diasporas, and cultural diasporas. So African Guyanese or in, in Guyana or, or our descendants, they fall into the category that he calls victim diasporas, which result from slavery. But I prefer the term enslavement African diaspora because enslavement African diaspora speaks to the process by which the group became a diaspora as opposed to putting a sort of a label or, or describing a state of being. The second stage of diasporization after physical separation is remembering, which entails emotional or psychological fractures. In this, in this seminal state, it is imperative that members of the displaced group draw on what they already know to create a sense of normalcy. Displacement creates emotional and psychological fractures because the things, the practices, the people um, and the people that the displaced group regarded as mundane and normal 
are no longer present. And to quote, and to quote to Suda, neither the sending or receiving country serves any longer as a stable source of social belonging, end quote. As time, as time progresses and subsequent generations emerge, emerge, the displaced group gradually becomes placed in their new geographic space. This placing involves some remembering and some forgetting of practices from previous homelands, particularly by older generations. The last or the third stage of diasporization is cultural mixing, which necessitates cultural fractures. Even when memories remain, they must coexist in the minds and realities of the displaced in tandem with more recent experiences and memories that might be more crucial for survival. Often the newer experiences include transnational and transethnic mixing that uniquely color the cultural values and interpretations and reshape the everyday lives of those who are placed. As much as diasporas draw on elements of the past, particularly former homelands, to inform their sense of group identity, their experiences with other ethnic groups uniquely shape what they subsequently become. Through the process of acculturation, whereby ethnic groups experience cultural changes due to sustained long-term contact with each other, a diaspora learns new languages, adopts new foods, and undergoes other metamorphoses. In the process also, the diaspora retains some of the cultural elements of the past, but becomes significantly different than the citizens still residing in previous homelands. The diaspora and its cultural expressions can therefore be said to be creolized, a new entity in a new place created from older, more distinct elements from other places. If we look at if we look at the African Guyanese diaspora, one of the things I thought about when I thought about the African diaspora, Guyanese diaspora is that they're working with three distinct homelands. They're working with a, a more distant homeland Africa. They're working with Guyana in which they are a primary African diaspora and they're working with the United States. And so African Guyanese in the United States on which my book um, is, play, uh, is uh, focused, they are literally negotiating identities. They're constantly shifting. Um, when am I Guyanese? When am I just Guyanese? When am I Black? When am I American? How do I navigate these three spaces? And this is where the Kwekwa ritual comes in. But what, what, um, what does the African Guyanese diaspora in New York City entail? Let's go to figure um, Dissecting the Secondary African Guyanese Diaspora, if you can go to that one. Yes. So one of the things that we often do when we talk about diasporas, we tend to talk about these displaced groups as sort of homogenous groups, but they're not. Because in examining the African Guyanese Diaspora, <laughs> there are three distinct groups within this larger group in the United States. They are those that I call the migrated diaspora that, that consists of individuals who were born in Guyana and later migrated to the United States. Um, United States. The, I, I think of an exception as those individuals who were born in Guyana, but migrated to the United States when they were very young, like birth to teenage years. Often they behave more like members of group two, the procreated diaspora. And those, uh, the procreated diaspora consists of children of two migrated Guyanese parents, of one migrated, Guyanese parents, but children of Guyanese ancestry, such as they have Guyanese grandmothers and um, they were raised by Guyanese or they self-identify in some ways Guyanese. And then there's a third group, which I find to be very interesting, but many of us, I think we can, those of us who have married non-Guyanese, we can sort of um, identify with this. I call this group the final diaspora. That is spouses of Guyanese um, broadly construed who at some times or at all times, choose to identify as Guyanese or with the Guyanese community by engaging in various um, activities and processes. They, they eat the food, they learn the, Cre um, the uh, Creolese and things like that. And so if we, as we examine the, the African Guyanese diaspora, we see that this is one of the reasons that this process of rediasporization, becoming a diaspora's diaspora is so complex because even as you move, the group becomes more complex. 
right? Because the group is now complex. So how do you satisfy the needs of um, these different segments of the African Guyanese diaspora in the, in the United States? And so this is where the Kwekwa ritual comes in. And so Kwekwa night offers African Guyanese, the diversity of um, um, African Guyanese in the diaspora, a chance to modify the values, um, their own certain values to accommodate newness, um, even as they hold on to the kwekwe and other, um, to the kwekwe, to food and other practices. So it's a constant, it's, so, it's sort of a dance. So I don't know if you have the image of the, the bride, um, the bride wiping the floor. If you can, if you have that one, cause I'm looking at two different things here. So for example, gendered values are, um, are one of those values that I see African Guyanese in the United States, African Guyanese American, Americans having to modify most. In many instances, what it means to be a woman comes under scrutiny. They must reevaluate, so reevaluate that. So in Guyana, it might be okay to say, you got to learn how to scrub and clean and wipe, right? You got to cook for your husband. Nothing's wrong with that. But what happens when you come to, Uni to the United States and that woman has a job, right? And uh, maybe she had worked, she worked in Guyana, but she, in Guyana, it might've been okay to say, well, yes, you're working nine to five, but you come home and do this. In the United States, um, we now are forced to say, okay, this is what makes me Guyanese, but how do I modify it? We find some people coming up with, with new strategies. So in some instances, I'm not gonna spend half an hour grating coconuts. I'm gonna use the canned coconut milk. So I'm still gonna get that cocoa price, but how am I gonna make it? So this is what the process of rediasperization involves. It involves some holding on and it involves some letting go. It involves some reanalyzing of home, some reconceptualizing of home because you are existing now in a sort of a liminal state where you're neither there nor here. And for those of us who've lived abroad for a long time, and this is something I heard over and over again, it's like you can never go home. <laughs> so they go home and they're like, yeah, but that's not, you know. So it's like I, the way I describe it is like being on the banks of the Demerara River. And so when you're on the, on the, on the, on the Wismer shore, you're looking over at Mackenzie because, yeah, I, this is where I go to school. This is where all the action is. But then when you're on the Mackenzie shore, you're looking over at the Wismer shore because this is where I was born. This is where I'm comfortable. This is, so this is what is happening. So what has happened as I continue to um, examine, um, as I continue to examine, come to my Kwekwe or the Kwekwe night in New York City, I see that its goal is not just to, is not just to have, for, is not just jollification or the role of come to my Kwekwe is not just jollification. But because of the way it is executed, the deliberate way that the organizers explain certain segments, explain this is what we're doing and this is what it means, something that is not necessary in Guyana because people would watch, they will catch on or they're already exposed, they're explaining. So it now becomes a tool for, edu a vehicle for education for the younger generations, for the final diaspora, for the procreated diaspora. Right, And so what is also happening, and this is where I would wrap up, is that I, I suspect that over time, Come to My Kwekwe will surpass traditional Kwekwe, which is a relatively isolated event in importance and relevance in the Guyanese community because it's happening with a specific family. The traditional Kwekwe takes place when somebody is getting married. In fact, younger generations who might be interested in continuing the, the Kwekwe tradition would be able to access videos on YouTube and social media to learn about Kwekwe. However, the media they harvest will more than likely show iterations of Come to My Kwekwe, which is, which is the case. Even older Guyanese in Guyana and the United States are turning to Come to My Kwekwe to learn about their heritage. I experienced this phenomenon firsthand during my dissertation research when I interviewed a middle-aged African Guyanese man regarded as a Kwekwe expert in the Guyanese community. During our interview, he explained to me that due to the infrequency of traditional Kwekwe performance in Guyana, he had forgotten many of the songs he sang in his youth. Thus, he often turned to the recordings of Come to My Kwekwe that friends brought from the United States and videos he sees on YouTube to, YouTube to see quote unquote, see how to do a quote unquote proper traditional Kwekwe. 
He represents an increasing number of Guyanese in the United States and Guyana that are embracing Come to My Kwekwe or the Kwekwe Night as the standard, or as the standard, or at least a standard. The wedding-based or traditional Kwekwe continues to be practiced, but in the rediasporized African Guyanese community in the United States, Come to My Kwekwe or Kwekwe Night is increasingly viewed as authentic. More importantly, for many African Guyanese American Americans. Come to my Kwekwe is now their tradition. This is largely because it facilitates the mending of fractures created from migration and the rediasporizing process. It also enables African Guyanese Americans to individually and collectively gather the seemingly disparate elements of their identities and their community to negotiate cultural difference, belonging, and wholeness. Ultimately, Come to my Kwekwe allows African Guyanese Americans to pick up the pieces. And that is what rediasporization is about. It's picking up the pieces in order to become again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Dr. Julian Richards, please, ladies and gentlemen. And if you have not been with us from the beginning of our event, you may not have been able to see that there is a thread running through here. And in the next few minutes, we will examine that thread. But before we begin to do that, may I introduce the last speaker for today? And this is Dr. Vibert Cambridge. Dr. Cambridge, is going to present a paper on the carbonated, note the word please, sweet drink, carbonated sweet drink. And this is part of a forthcoming um, book entitled, subtitle, sorry, A Social History of Non-Alcoholic Carbonated Beverages in Guyana from 1870 to 2019. Dr. Cambridge. Thank you very much, um, Juliet. Uh, Samuel, could you start with the slide, first slide, please? Ladies and gentlemen, the term sweet drink is used here to refer to non-alcoholic carbonated beverages. Other terms are used to describe this commodity include aerated beverages, soft drinks, soda, and pop. The upcoming book, Sweet Drink, A Social History of Non-Alcoholic Carbonated Beverages in Guyana, 1870 to 2019, states that this is a story about immigration, cultural changes, the discourses about respectability, hygiene, and public health. It is also a story about diaspora engagement and product resilience. In this presentation, and following the um, theme already established, we will explore the role of a selection of immigrants who came to Guyana since 1838 and have played a significant role in the development of the sweet drink industry in Guyana. Starting in 1746 with Lawrence Storm Van Gravesand, his opening of Demerara, the colony became synonymous with a place where one went to try one's luck. Thus, the subtitle or the focus for this afternoon's presentation, Trying Their Luck. Many came to the hot and humid colony where the water to quench the ever-present thirst was suspect, sometimes too salty, most times too irony, and sometimes during the regular drought in short supply. At times, water had to be shipped into Georgetown from rivers and creeks. The English were among the first, among the earliest to take up Gravesan's offer. They opened plantations along the coast. To those plantations came involuntarily enslaved Africans. And starting in 1834, came indentured labor. First Portuguese, primarily from Madeira, Indians and Chinese from Asia, and Africans, especially Congo and Crew. When the Prussian scientist Richard Schomburg 
stepped ashore in Georgetown on Saturday, January the 22nd, 1840. He was surprised to find Germans, I quote, 100 Rhinelanders, Württembergers, and Swabians who, like their countrymen before them, wanted to try their luck. They had arrived the day before. During that first day, Schomburg would encounter a ship just in from Madeira with Portuguese who were attracted by similar ideas. Other nationalities encountered during that day in January 1840 included Canadians, Maltese, and West Indians. According to the census of October 1841, the total population in the British Guyana was 97,695. Next slide, please, Samuel. Right, in that slide, we would note that among the, um, that population, um, Portuguese from Madeira total 2,219, English, Irish, and Scots 2,162, Dutch, French, and German um, immigrant um, members of the population 445, also from the Americas, North America 159. Between 1835 and 1843, 30,981 immigrants landed in British Guyana. Next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, landed in Guyana. Again, um, Schomburg um, was surprised um, to find that uh, the hawkers in Georgetown, they were selling ice imported um, to the West Indies uh, from North America. For almost three decades, British Guyana, like other communities in the colonial tropics, had been importing ice from Massachusetts and Canada. Ice was an important ingredient in the colony's refreshment culture. It was an important ingredient in the renowned alcoholic based swizzle. And to cool that wide range of sweet native drinks, such as mobby, fly, ginger beer, and bubble, that were consumed at homes or dispensed at street corners or in very small shops known as bub shops. Georgetown in 1840 was an importer's paradise. Again, according to Schomburg, shops offered for sale everything that a European um, would think of as luxury and high living. From North America came flour, potatoes, salt fish, pork, peas, biscuits, cheese, butter, herring, horses, pigs, dots, rice, onions, dried apples, pears. Also featured in his list of imports uh, was distilled water. British Guyana's primary export was internationally sought after commodity, the Demerara sugar. Significant in that moment were commission agents and professionals. They were the linchpins in the economy. There were indications in the 1840s that the colony's economy was beginning to change in 1842. Folks were beginning to harvest the hinterlands forests and mineral resources. There was also action in the hospitality and the food and beverage sectors. These developments increased opportunities for trying one's luck. Next slide, please. Jose Gomes de Gar was one who tried his luck in the hospitality, food and beverage sector. He had arrived as an immigrant from Madeira in 1842 and initially operated a small provisions business at Plantation Montrose and subsequently he traded at Plaisance. By 1885, his business included a chain of liquor stores, a cocoa and chocolate factory, a schooner shipping agency. When he died in 1893, he was considered one of the wealthiest men in British Guyana, leaving a fortune of about $400,000, approximately 57 billion Guyana dollars in 2020. Next slide, please. In 1896, his sons, Jose Jr., Manuel, Francisco, and John bought the Demerara Ice House which was opened in 1846. They bought this um, building 
uh, that business for $50,000. The building was designed by the Maltese architect Cesar Castellani and was funded by the colony's government in response to the increased number of folks coming to try their luck in British Guyana. The Degar brothers renamed the property Degar's Ice House, uh, DIH. Among the facilities in that property when the brothers bought it in 1896 was a soda factory. By 1870, Alexander Russell, a Georgetown-based commission agent, was distributing carbonation plants and bottling technologies manufactured by Brit Britby and Winchcliffe of Manchester in British Guyana and to Trinidad and Tobago. By, eight, by 1914, there were 10 aerated drink bottlers in Georgetown, most of them located on Water Street and in contiguous locations. All of them appear to have been owned by immigrants. Next slide, please. Among those listed in 1914 that went on to have a substantial impact in Guyana's sweet drink industry was the bottling plant of the cold storage and ice depot. The company was created by two Prussians, Carl Wheating and Gustav Henri Richter in 1871. Initially, their dominant business was exporting the highly sought after Demerara crystal sugar. When that business lapsed after the end of the American Civil War, they established Guyana's first ice factory, a cold storage facility, the bottling plant, and a biscuit factory. They invested in the food and beverage sector. Next slide, please. Um, Carl Victor and Richter died in Guyana. Um, Victor uh, Wheating's memorial is in St. George's Cathedral. Um, in time, DIH and CSID, uh, CSID emerged as the dominant players in the local soft drink industry. But for a long time, there were several small community-based bottlers in urban, rural, and hinterland Guyana, who were also players in the industry. They specialized in a distinctive product, bottled in a small six-ounce green or black bottle fondly known as the small lemonade. This became and remains an iconic Guyanese aerated beverage. The owners of these factories also tended to be immigrants or the immediate descendants of immigrants. Names such as Muntas Ali, Chia Tau, Diabru, Dirik, Dow, Khan, Mohammed, Posad, Rees, Siabra, Suarez, White, and Williams are associated with this aspect of the sweet drink industry. They are fondly known as the lemonade people. Next slide, please. These are the lemonade people slide. Um, Verdun um, in Georgetown and Siabra in- No. All right, forget about it, don't worry. I got onto these people here that got some Zoom thing. Thank you very much, person. Whoever, please mute your mic. Um, World War II and the stationing of the American military in British Guyana marks the arrival of the big American brands in the colony. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Right. By 1939 and early 40s, Wheating and Richter um, was uh, bought in Coca Cola and later the Juicy brand. Next slide, please. In 1942, DIH had acquired the franchises for Coca-Cola and the IC brands. Next slide, please. Um, in the immediate post-war years, banks, DIH and CSID fought for market share. Also in the same period of time, especially after 1953, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola took on additional importance as they represented American foreign policy. It was at this moment we see the expansion of the Rahman's um, soda factory, also known as Republic Soda Factory. In 1958, the company owned by Mir Amjad Rahman was already bottling Red Spot, 
on the franchise from SM Jalil of Trinidad and Tobago. At, in that time, they acquired the Coca-Cola franchise and launched the king size Coca-Cola um, product. On the right um, image, it's um, the bottling of the king size Coca-Cola in British Guyana. This innovation, that is the king size Coca-Cola, was just one of several marketing and promotional strategies utilized by these three dominant companies to acquire and dominate the sweet drink market in Guyana. Crumb car competitions, photographic contests, beauty contests, radio promotions, and newspaper advertising were all tools used in the arsenal to develop and maintain demand for sweet drinks in Guyana. During this fight, many of the small bottlers took a However, Verdun so aerated soda factory, founded by Trinidadian immigrants in 1920 and later purchased by Alfred Mohammed in the 1940s, was holding its own in the marketplace. Alfred Mohammed was the son of an indentured laborer from India. During the middle decades of the 20th century, DIH, later Banks DIH, under the leadership of Peter Stanislaus Degar, the grandson of Jose Gomez Degar, who came to Guyana in 1842, became the dominant player in the, in the industry. Um, he established a new bottling plant at Rheinfeld with state-of-the-art technologies and operated a national distribution network. Next slide, please. This was the sort of infrastructure that won Banks DIH, the Puma franchise. Puma was a soy-based fortified food developed to address the problem of malnutrition in the developing world. Guyana was a test site. It was an experiment to test acceptability. The experiment drew upon the high levels of sweet drink consumption in Guyana, along with the effective distribution infrastructure operated by Banks DIH. When production ceased during the late 1970s, it was considered a massive success. But Banks DIH did not have all of the market. The politics of the time influenced market share, especially in rural communities in which the descendants of Indian immigrants were in the majority. Peter Degar had emerged as a major anti-communist crusader in Guyana. Among East Indians in rural Guyana, this was not an ideological position. It was an anti Chedi Jagan position. So Peter Degar's sweet drinks were boycotted. According to a co-researcher, Whitting and Richter were the beneficiaries. They consolidated this position by providing 30-day credit to start of rural groceries. In addition to sweet drinks, Whitting and Richter provided ice and salt biscuits on credit. Whitting and Richter was also associated with the rice industry. The factors that caused the cessation of the bottling of Puma in the 1970s um, had economy-wide repercussions. Starting in 1976, the economic problems facing Guyana were myriad. Earlier, the government led by LFS Burnham had declared itself to be socialist and adopted nationalization as a dominant strategy. The global geopolitical backlash along with the OPEC oil crisis generated a lot of pain in the society. There was little or no foreign currency available. So the sweet drink industry, which was totally dependent on external inputs, took a deep licking. Republic Soda Factory closed. Reading and Richter sold out to Banks DIH. Banks DIH even closed production for a short period. A few of the lemonade people remained in business, and on occasion, Verdon provided some help to beat Banks DIH. However, in the main, the community-based bottlers were decimated. Guyana's economic life began to rectify itself with the, jet with the jettisoning of the socialist path and the introduction in 1985 of the economic recovery program. Um, as a result, um, there was uh, one consequence of that shift was the re-energizing of the sweet drink industry. In less than a decade, there were three new players one homegrown and two were immigrants. The home, next slide please. The homegrown player was Demerara Distilleries Limited, formerly a state-owned corporation that was privatized in early 90s. 
Next slide, please. The immigrant from Trinidad was S.M. Jalil, and from Suriname, it was Rudisa. Um, by this time, there was a shift from glass bottles to plastic bottles. This coupled with changing lifestyles resulted in a national solid waste pollution problem. And the then government of Guyana introduced an environmental tax. This led to a case before the Caribbean Court of Justice. In this case, Rudisa and SM Jalil sued the government of Guyana for imposing what they determined as an illegal tax. The government of Guyana lost the case and had to re refund around 1.2 billion Guyana dollars in taxes that it had collected. By 2018, Guyana's aerated drink production averaged approximately 48 million liters per year. Next slide, please. Um, so the average Guyana um, um, production between 27, 2007 and 2018 was about 45 million liters per annum. The average amount of aerated drinks exported during that period was about 571,000 liters. Most of this was exported to countries um, such as Antigua, Barbuda, Canada, United States, Curaçao, Suriname, and the US Virgin Islands. But Diana was also importing almost um, 910,000 liters of imported soft drinks um, per year. Um, traditionally, the major sources of Guyana sweet drink imports were from the United States, Trinidad, and Suriname. Today, we are seeing increased imports from China, the Republic of Korea, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Thailand. I hypothesize that this is related to recent trends in immigration to Guyana. Since the 1990s, Guyana has seen increasing numbers of immigrants from China, Southeast Asia, the, um, and this is also um, reflected in the increasing importance of soft drinks. Um, globally, there are public health concerns about the consequences of excessive sweet drink consumption. During the period 2007 to 2018, the average per capita consumption of sweet drink in Guyana was approximately 1,600 um, 12 ounce bottles of soda per annum, about four bottles per day. School children are consuming more than one bottle of soda per day. Um, to keep it in liters term, we are consuming about 1.4 liters uh, per day. The global trend is replacing sugar with artificial sweetness and shifting to bottling juices, water, and sports drinks. Current data suggests that Guyana uh, is following some elements in this trend. There is increasing bottling of water. DDL has invested in fruit orchards and uncover corroborated data indicates that Guyana is in importing artificially sweetened beverages from overseas. Next slide, please. Um, and speaking about, um, so one result of the economic decline of 1980 was the development of local flavors. Bans DIH did this with Carambola. Are we going to see an increase in locally produced syrups and essences in the future? But that's a topic for another, um, another discussion. Um, talking about immigration, migration, diaspora, and re-migration. The Guyanese diaspora is a large one. Some statistics suggest that there are more Guyanese living abroad than those at home. One thing that has followed Guyanese abroad is the persistence of our taste cultures. This is so evident with the love for the small lemonade. From the slide here, you can see um, Tomboy, the Tomboy brand in New York in Sybils, or in Toronto, the um, lady, uh, the lemonade brand. Um, today, it is possible to get a small cold lemonade from Tomboy brand in New York. The lemonade brand is bottled by Verdon aerated soda factory, which ceased operations in Guyana in, 18, in 20, 2012, but its subsidiary bottles it in New York, and it is still owned by the Mohammed family. Next slide, please. 
When Verdun ceased population, uh, production in Guyana, its equipment was sold to the Crown Royal factory located in Quarantine, Bodice. Today, Crown Royal Lemonade has a national presence. In the interim, as I close, what have we learned? We've learned that immigrants to Guyana pioneered the sweet drink industry, that they were charismatic, entrepreneurial, and influenced all aspects of Guyanese society, scientific, social, cultural, economic, and political. The industry has showcased resilience and tenacity. Despite all the pressure, the small lemonade in the iconic green bottle has maintained its presence. There are even indications of a resurgence in Guyana. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Thanks to Facebook, Facebook co-researchers, including my daughter, Shala Cambridge Harper, Hemwan Passad, Sarah Rehaman, and my dear friend and buddy, the late Derry Epkins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cambridge. We've had four absolutely fascinating presentations on subjects that we did not think would be worthy of research. And I say that very carefully, because my next question will be this. Suppose a student, maybe even 12 years old, 10 years old, suppose someone maybe of 20 or 21 goes in on what Dr. Cambridge has just said about the ingest, ingestion, yes, the drinking of all of those sweet drinks. What does that mean? Suppose someone hones in on what Dr. Randy Brown said about that survival spirit. Suppose someone, again, listen carefully to what Dr. Richard Graves said about creating a moral stance within this country by recreating, in a sense, a nation called Guyana. We listen carefully as Rod Westmus discussed the shock, the psychic shock, it must still be a wound, of arriving somewhere where you thought you would be welcomed only to be kicked in the teeth. Right? Now suppose a youngster, we just had SWS, wants to do research on what you have just said. Suppose that person wants to go further, maybe trace the incidence of diabetes in Guyana, you know, as soft drinks or carbonated drinks became more popular. Suppose someone listened carefully to Dr. Jillian Richards Graves, and she said that people in New York look to New York for words about Kwekwe. I heard that. Where would you send that person? I'm asking you, um, my friends, my scholarly friends here, why have you engaged in this research? And to whom is it aimed? And who is your audience? Let's start with those. Um, do you want me to call you one by one? Or are you going to put your hand up and say, me, me, me? You, you call. Call you? No, okay. you, call, you call. You call the group. Gosh, I feel, feel like a school teacher. Randy, where are you going to find out all these things, boy? <laughs> no, he's American. He probably does not understand what I just said. Um, Dr. Brown. <laughs> what is this research? My, uh, yeah, my, my limited time in Guyana, sadly limited, means that my, you know, grasp of Guyanese Creole is limited to kind of simple things like liming, right? Um, and doesn't always translate as well as I'd like to. Um, I think on, wow, I have so many thoughts and questions from my, my fellow panelists here, but to answer uh, Juliet's question, um, I would hope that my work's aimed at people in and out of Guyana and that people both Guyanese and Guyanese in the diaspora, uh, and then people who had never heard of Guyana before, which is frankly most Americans, as those of you who spent time in the States know, they often think I'm talking about the West African nation of Ghana, right? When you mention Guyana and you say, no, no, no. And you have to go through this uh, kind of geography lesson here. Um, what I would hope, especially Guyanese uh, scholars and scholars interested in Guyana take from my work is just how understudied the history of slavery is in Guyana. And the records are so, so rich. 
Um, and so I'm, when I'm, especially when I'm talking to junior academics, graduate students, and other um, younger than me researchers who are kind of new in their profession, I really try to encourage them to consider working on Demerara, Quibo, Berbice, um, because they're fascinating, because they're important, and because they're so understudied, um, even among people who work on the Caribbean. So I could say a lot more, but I'll, I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you. I know because we are at a limited time frame. Um, Dr. Cambridge, you mentioned various ethnicities arriving in Guyana from time to time. It seems as if Guyana is a land of migrants. However, where did you find all of this information? Well, well you know, it's sleuthing. Um, uh, find it in travelogues, find it in archives, um, find it in newspapers, um, find it in um, interviews. I give you one example, one story. There is a Facebook conversation um, going on um, quite recently around this um, sweet drink discourse. And someone was reflecting about during World War II, in which they mentioned that their family was the only Jewish family in Georgetown. And they provided a, a space on Sabbath um, for um, Jewish members of the American troops. And someone got back to them and said, um, sorry, you're, 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 you're wrong. Um, there were so many um, Jewish families um, in Guyana. For example, my uncle Joshi um, operated this sweet drink factory um, on the east coast of Demerara. So it is about triangulation. It is about, um, as, um, as Randy points out, you, you do archives, um, you do newspapers, you, do, you follow methods that Jillian, ethnographic methods, you interview people. And one of the things we have in, um, in, 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 in places with these large diasporas are memories. Now memories could be faulty, but memories do provide you with clues for what to go and search and triangulate. So, History, social sciences, it's, it's like a detective work. You, you know, um, you've got to be um, passionate. The other thing is, I wish I were multilingual because, you know, uh, for example, there's a new book out now um, by um, Marjolaine Kors, and she's doing a, 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 a fantastic work on the 1763 um, Borbis um, re re Rebellion. And she's drawing upon a data source that many Guyanese scholars have not had access to. Um, this is the interrogations of captured um, rebel, rebels um, who um, gave testimony that was written down. That's written down in Old Dutch and resides in an archive in, England, um, in Holland. Now, that is the kind of research and scholarship um, that, that we need. And this helps to break down some of the narrow um, um, questions um, that, we've been, that we've looked at in terms of the Guyana experience that unfortunately have become propagandized. You know, um, a lot of propaganda surrounds uh, um, the, 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 the patterns of um, resistance. A lot of propaganda surrounds immigration. So this kind of destabilization of, of, of propaganda with evidence-based scholarship and public um, e exposure is, is, is what I think is, uh, is important. And that is what drives my um, research. Topics that are not traditional, but topics when you explore them, help you to get a much more textured appreciation of what the Guyana experience has been. And so, so. let us turn then to Rod Westmus. Rod? Yes, I'm here. Yeah research, the methods, and perhaps going to methodology. I'll just tell you my research methods. It was, it was pretty simple. It was going out there and speaking to the people, getting to know them, um, and, and coupling that with my growing up in, in, in the United Kingdom, coming here as a two and a half year old infant, but not knowing about my, my Guyanese heritage, really, um, and, and, and and quite simply being spat on on, on occasions as, as as a young colored boy, um, but I, I'm I'm I, I, eth ethnicity stood out. So I, I as I got older and was fortunate to be sent back to Guyana to go to secondary school, 
And by the way, um, by Bert, I enjoyed uh, a tennis roll with my small lemonade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, 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 I, I came back and, and I, I felt Guyanese, but there, there were so many others here in the United Kingdom that did not get that experience. So I just had a thirst for, for digging and digging. And I, I became um, um, a, a member of the, um, the British Archives and the, and, and the um, British Library. And it's, it's, it's wonderful at times what you can glean from these um, institutions. Um, and the people that we meet, Juanita and I at our Guyana Speaks, they sit us down and they tell us all these old time stories and we, 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 we record them. And uh, the, the, the book that, you, that we have now is just, uh, I think, the start of what we, what we want to do. The diverse range of interviews of all ethnicities, though, is, is, is so important because we didn't only interview, interview people with uh, an African background. We had Chinese, we had Portuguese, we had Indian, and all of them have different stories to tell and different experiences. So that was so important. And that was so important to Dr. Webb as well, because he otherwise would not have gained access to these individuals had it not been for us. So we, 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 we were the, um, the conduit, if you will. So I hope that answered some of the questions. Yes, yeah, this is absolutely fascinating. And I will go now to Julian, Julian Richards Graves and ask her about Kwekwe in Brooklyn. Some of us never did Kwekwe in Guyana. So she's going to tell us about her research methods. Yes, exactly. So um, I, as I said before, I started in 2005. Um, and one of the things I did, I did a lot of interviews, but I also did, a, I took a lot of life histories. And so as you sit with people sometimes to interview them, they will tell you about their own lives. And in doing so, you get, a, you get a, an idea. They paint a picture for you <clears throat> of a time, of a place, of experiences that you might never have, um, have had. And so they take you back in time, so to speak. And so I did a lot of interviews. Let's I also, down there. Say that again? Oh, <laughs> somebody's talking. Uh, I did a lot of interviews. I did, I did a lot of archival, trying to support that with um, the data that existed in libraries, sometimes in people's personal libraries um, in Guyana, because um, I found out that uh, many of the older folks had books that were no longer in publication. The publishers had gone defunct and things like that. So, and for me, the most important part of doing the research in New York City was observation. So it meant that I had to um, just um, watch and sometimes participant observation. I got involved in the dancing and the singing and everything. Because it's one thing to write about it, it's one thing to look at it. But when you're doing it, it's a different experience altogether. Thank you. What advice do you have for a younger scholar than yourself trying to emulate what you have just done? Yes, my advice would be number one, <clears throat> to be open minded. Because I remember when I started this research, it was a very frustrating thing. Because as I would ask older Guyanese about Kwekwe, many of them would shy away. They would say, we don't do that thing anymore. It's, it's, it's dead, it's pagan, it's backwards. We don't do it anymore. And I became so frustrated. And I, I remember I was doing a small project for class and I went to my advisor and I said, I know they're lying because I know this woman had a, a Kwekwe in her basement for her daughter and they're lying to me. They're such hypocrites. And I went on on my high horse and he said, write about that. That is part of the process. And then find out why they're apprehensive. And so I kept asking questions and I kept listening. And what I heard was that number one, this is grown folk business. So this is something that takes place with big people at nights in the villages, it was dark. So you can wind up and carry on. You can act uh, what would uh, in manners that would re be regarded as unseemly. And that was okay. And so for many of these older women that, and men that I, would, that I was talking to, they were Christians, they were higher up in their churches. They didn't know how um, I might've taken it, how they would have been represented. And a big part of it is representation. What will you write? What will you put out there? How will it make me look? And so I would say to the young person coming up, ask questions and listen. 
because a lot of times the older people don't tell because they don't think we are willing, able, and ready to hear. And sometimes we don't know what to ask. So just listen. Sometimes we just listen. And so that's what I would advise them. Keep asking, keep listening, and be open-minded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I am going to put two questions out there. I mentioned them earlier. Um, the first one will be for Rod Westmans. And someone sent this question um, about the trope of window shopping, the concept uh, he actually put of window shopping. Um, do you mention that at all? Is that mentioned in your essay collection? Uh, do, do you, you know, I know about window shopping and you're talking about in Georgetown. Is it? Is that what they're alluding to as a as a child going window shopping? Hello, you hearing me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I I I did not include that as a, as as a, a question, and not many people, nobody, I believe, brought it up as something that they did with any regularity. I do remember doing it as a young child, um, going on the evening to Booker's and Fogarty's and. Um, with the other stores, bet in courts, and, uh, so, and and just looking, I remember actually seeing the first television set. I believe it was Sandwich Parker in the in the window of uh, of that store, and 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 there was such a crowd around it because there was no TV in Guyana, and everybody was ogling at this thing. What is that? Is what a? It is it's, it's a television. Well, it was. I think it played black and white anyway, but. Um, I, 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 uh, um, and then, and then afterwards, we went to Brown Betty for an ice cream. I, I, that's about what I, what I remember of the window shopping. So what about I, you, Vibert? I don't know why the person was so interested in window shopping. And yeah, I, I, if window if window shopping is used as metaphor, in that what you look at in the window as what you longed for or what was promoted that you should get. Um, then one could see um, going to England or going abroad. Um, I went abroad myself in that early 60s. And um, in Sandwich Parker, their travel agency, you had these uh, posters about traveling on the MV Scania um, to go to England, you know, you know, um, and the song, How Much Was the Doggy in the Window, which is a That's popular right. song. That's that right. Um, the, 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 the window was a place that um, promoted the posters for Pan Am and all these things you promoted going abroad and you know, what you could get. It's, almost, it's also um, not uh, interesting to know that all the windows in, in Guyana are now uh, covered up with, with, with metal. And I'm wondering if that's a function of the, when we had those riots in the 60s. Yeah. So they don't and get broken. They don't get broken. So um, yeah, the, 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 I, the, the, that's maybe that's something the artists could um, could do a riff on. You know, <laughs> the filmmakers could do a riff mm. on that. Yeah, that is uh, that's a very interesting um, concept. But the next question I, I found very interesting, and this one is for Dr. Cambridge, and I'm going to read what the person said. Carbonated bottled drinks had a long shelf life, whereas homemade Moby, Sorrel, Fly, etc., had a tendency of becoming overripe, turning into alcohol or rancid if left for a long period, mainly because of lack of preservatives in those days. And I think what the person is actually asking is how did the development of science, how is that related to the carbonated drink? And if in your text, you are going to have a chapter on that. Well, um, it, that, that is, um, that's a good question. Um, carbonated beverages, when they were introduced into Ghana, were introduced with the narrative that they were modern, that they were clean, that they were much more sophisticated. You know, for example, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola um, marketed themselves as being manifestations of modernity. And if you stayed around with this Moby and ginger beer and, uh, you know, and fly and jamun drink and pine drink, you were really doing some backward mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So you have these two contending 
ideas um, taking place. Um, so the American consul in Georgetown in 1914, who, who was scoping out business, and that's what the American consul um, did, was scope out business opportunities um, in Guyana. And he said, he thought that the soda fountain was going to replace these um, sweetened um, home, these sweetened home beverages. Um, that didn't take place. Um, but the, the big issue with um, the homemade drinks becoming overripe and therefore developing an alcoholic um, dimension was not lost on the Guyana sweet drink industry. Because if you look, there's a thing called Shandy. Shandy is right at that edge there of carbonated non-alcoholic and low alcohol um, sweet drink. You know, that is riffing on baby sham and all of that. But the big, the big, the big, the big um, policy issue in Guyana was reported in, the, 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 and if my friend Aubrey McQuart is on here, in 1960, the, um, the government analyst department spoke about concerns about two things. One was the um, use of silicate acid as the preservative and that being replaced by sodium benzoate. Today, most of the preservatives in carbonated beverages, sodium benzoate. Back in the 60s, they were concerned about the use of salicylate uh, um, um, acid. They were also concerned about the misrepresentation of labeling. So when you call something orange aid, it may not have any orange in it. The big issue now is if Banks BIH was able to show in 1970s and 1980s that they could take carambola and convert that into a carbonated beverage, um, what is the problem with carbonating cherry or you know, pine drink or whatever, as opposed to importing um, that, um, those essences? The issue is, is the soft drink industry doing anything about that? There are positive indicators in the society. For example, Bank, um, Demerara Distillery, when they distill rum, one of the byproducts of distillation is carbon dioxide. And they are using that carbon dioxide to carbonate um, their sweet drink. So I would see if that partnership between places like the University of Guyana um, and you know, other a new generation of entrepreneurs emerge that you can see um, a, 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 a development in which locally made essences, locally made flavorings will now have the shelf life that you can get from a Coca-Cola syrup or a Vimto syrup or one of those other syrups. So it is at the cost of science and technology. And this is what is, you know, folks have identified that the food and beverage sector is really the growing sector in the Guyanese economy. So maybe that question, which is an excellent question, will get answered in practice on the ground. It has been a question around for a long time, um, uh, and uh, hopefully it will be addressed um, substantially in the future. Such, this was such a fascinating two hours. We've come to four o'clock. And before our team decides it's time for us to halt, may I just say one thing? Thank you all. It was fantastic. There was one more question for Randy, and that was, yeah. But, you know, I think maybe um, we'll do that another time because that is the spirit business. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to look for the texts that have just been discussed by our four scholars, Dr. Viber Cambridge, Dr. Randy Brown, Dr. Jillian Richards Graves, and the activist Rod Westmus. Thank you all so much to be part of our 2020 Literary Hang and Symposium. And Thank you very much for being a great moderator, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Uh, heads up to um, Peter Gordon, who is watching the streaming, and to the Samuel, Ro, yeah. and by adoption, Marcia. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys, thank you. Okay. And now you may.